Hello and welcome to the October France Formation Move to France Q&A session. I'm Allison grant Ness. I own the relocation agency Your France Formation. And we help people to get the right visa to create their dream life in France. So we work with people mainly who are either retired or who are moving for self-employment or to start a business. And we help them to get their visas correctly and to get set up and settled in France. So we have cute questions that have been submitted in advance. You can also submit questions through the chat or the Q&A. I will occasionally look at those things as well. Before we get started, I want to share about the Bloom Where You're Planted event at the American Church in Paris, which is coming up this Saturday. So Bloom Where You're Planted is an annual event, which is now over 50 years old. There was like one year where they didn't do it. Last year it was virtual because of COVID. I presented about visas. And this year we are back in person and I'm going to be hosting a table with Kim, my colleague who is coming up from Montpellier where she is based. And I'm also going to be doing a Q&A on the French healthcare system there. So if you are in Paris or can get to Paris, you are welcome to join us this weekend. Let me put the link to purchase tickets in the in the chat. And I want to share, I've got some swag that I'm going to be giving away. So I want to share what that looks like and give you a little bit of a sneak preview. So first thing is I ordered these purple bags. Unfortunately, the Perp, the text came out a little bit too dark. So I'm going to try to order white ones and see for the future. But we have some tote bags. It says, which I really like, we have some folders to put all of your documents for going to your visa appointment or to the prefecture. And this is the first, you got, unless you follow my Instagram stories, this, your, this is like the first sharing of these that I've done. We've got little 2023 calendars that have, if you can see, I'm not sure if you can see, they have all the French jour férié circled, they have all of the American federal holiday circled, and they have all of our monthly Q&A circled through the end of 2023, and they're a magnet so they can conveniently go on your fridge. And we also have these little postcards that have our Q&A dates, and they have foolproof French visas and the podcast. So we're going to be giving out those. And I got an exciting little gift because I had fun making all of this swag. So I had this exciting little gift that I got for Kim and Lauren. So we our team right now is Kim, who is going to be coming on full-time very soon. Lauren, who is part-time. Melissa, who is, she's our client out, new client outreach person who's calling all of our potential clients to just talk with them about their plans to move to France. And we have Amy, who is helping with some of the business plans. And I got them all a little gift. So, ce café m'aide à créer la vie de mes rêves. And it matches all of the other swag that I got. So they don't know about that yet. They might if they watch this replay, but that's a gift that I'm going to be giving to Kim when I see her in person for the very first time later this week and to the other ladies when I'm going to mail it to them. So that is our exciting swag. We will have this at our table. Oh, we also have pens, but I don't know. I don't have one handy. Stop by, have some swag, and then we have invited our clients to have an apéro with us after after the event, or even if they're not coming to the event. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with the questions that have been pre-submitted. And like I said, please do feel free to submit additional questions um, in the chat. Thank you, Michelle. This is a Canva background. <laughs> I met I met a woman from Democrats Abroad for the first time in person a couple of weeks ago. She was doing a uh, vote from abroad registrations outside of Shakespeare and Co. And so I went over to say hi. And I was wearing a purple shirt, not this one. She was like, oh, I'm so glad to see that like your purple branding carries over into real life too. <laughs> like, yes, it does. 
Okay, so um, first question from Martine. I am a USA citizen with dual citizenship. I recently retired and plan on splitting my time in France and across Europe in 2023. My income is based on Social Security and drawing from my IRA. I plan on making Paris my base while I travel across Europe, but I understand that if I reside in France over 183 days, I will have to pay French taxes. Can you provide insight, recommendations on best options to avoid paying these taxes? Okay, so first of all, if the French tax treaty, the tax treaty between France and the US is going to determine where you pay your taxes. So it's true that being in France is going to make you a tax resident if you're in France for more than 183 days, but that's only one of the criteria. So, and they also look at the types of income and where the different types of income are taxed. So if your main sources of income are pension or retirement, funds and pensions in the U.S. that are related to work and investments that you have done during your working career in the U.S., those are going to be taxed only in the U.S. You will report them for taxation in France, but you will get a tax credit equivalent to the amount of French tax that you would otherwise pay. So your total tax due on those particular things should be zero. If it's not zero, you need to write to your tax office and have a chat with them about the tax treaty. This is different from other countries, like the UK does not have a tax treaty that is as advantageous as ours. So uh, don't necessarily take advice from somebody who has UK accounts and pensions and things like that. You won't be, you won't be double taxed. The tax treaty will avoid that. Now, if you have earned income in France. So let's say you're getting these pensions from the US and you have, you set up an auto entreprise or you set up a company or you get a salary or something in France. At that point, your French income is going to be taxed at a higher rate because they're going to take into account your US income when, when they determine your overall tax rate. So you won't necessarily be paying tax on those amounts, but it will push your other income up into a higher tax bracket. All right, Alex. I understand that there are incomes necessary for different visa types. My wife would want to make an auto, would want to be an entrepreneur. She sells artwork online, not making much yet. Would my retirement income factor in or does her business need to make the required income? So for an artist, a profession artistique visa, which it sounds like she would be, she would either be profession artistique or possibly artisanal. They are looking to see that the income is from the business. However, if you have cash and can support yourself and pay your bills, there are a little bit less sticklers about how much the business is bringing in versus how much you have in personal resources. So it's kind of a fine line to walk. Right now, for a profession artistique visa, they look at, they want 70% of minimum wage for your income, which is about 1,175 euros per month. So that's the ideal. That being said, if you do have bank accounts with cash in them, it's going to go a long way to assuaging their worries that if you don't have income with your business, that you're, they know you're still going to be able to pay your bills. If I choose a non-lucrative visa based on my retirement income, is there no way to adjust the status later if I want to freelance? So because your wife is going to be, if she's on a profession artistique visa, you would theoretically get a visa for the accompanying family member of a passport talent holder, in which case you will have the ability to work or to be self-employed if you want to. So that's probably a better option for you rather than going with a visitor visa and then trying to change your status later. That's what I would recommend. Cynthia, is it possible to become naturalized if we come with resources as retirees and have never worked in France, or is a 10-year card after staying for five years our only option to stay in France long-term? So it's going to be very difficult to get either of those things, and it's really going to depend on the discretion of the préfecture. So one of the sort of downsides of having this advantageous tax treaty is that your income is not going to be taxed in France, and you're not going to pay be paying into the French tax system. So when you are applying for naturalization, one of the things that they look at is they're looking at, are you making at least 1.5 times minimum wage, 1.5 times SNEEP, and are you 
paying taxes. And if you're not paying taxes, like you're very, you're not really a great candidate for becoming naturalized. Now, the thing about the 10 year card is they're looking at do you have five years of consistent income tax declarations? But there's also that concern of if you're not paying taxes into the French system and you're not working, why do you need a 10 year card? Like the visitor, the visitor status is not conducive to staying long term. So, I mean, you can renew the, the visitor visa status every year, but whether or not you will eventually get a multi-year card or even a 10-year card is very much at the discretion. I know some people who never get one. I know some people who have gotten them after 10 years or 15 years. And I know some people who are lucky and who were in the right prefecture and who requested it and who got it after five years. So it's really, I can't really answer that question because it very much depends on your situation. I will say that if you do want the potential for having a 10-year card, you want to ask them. Specifically, you want to write a letter in French at your renewal on the fifth year. And you want to make sure you have a language test showing you have at least an A2 level of French. And you want to have a bordereau fiscal, like a, a document from your tax office showing that you've been declaring, you've declared your taxes for at least five years. Similar question, if we come as language students with resources, would it be possible to become naturalized without working in France? Eventually, you're going to have to change your status from being a student to being something else. Like you cannot eternally have student status in France. So that's going to give you the same problem. You cannot you cannot get French citizenship while you are on a student visa. You have to change to something else first. And ideally something that is going to pay you a salary of at least 1.5 times minimum wage. Sheila, how many days do I have to move to France once I apply at VFS for a visa? I've heard it's 90 days. And why are the amount of days important to the process of living in France? Okay, so you can apply for the visa up to 90 days before your departure date. So if you plan on being in France on January 1st, 2023, you can apply for your visa, let's see, December, November, October 2nd. So you can apply for your visa today as the, if you want to be in France by the end of 2022. For... The time after you get an, on the visa application, you are going to designate the day that you're going to depart. So if you're applying, let's say when we have our clients who are applying for a visitor visa, at this time, you do not have to provide a plane ticket, but you have a long stay visa form with your departure date. It says, let's say January 1st, you have your reservation for an Airbnb or wherever you're staying that is going to start on January 1st, and you have your catastrophic health travel and health insurance policy required for the visitor visa that is also going to start on January 1st. So everything lines up. If you arrive on January 10th, it's not a big deal. You just have to arrive after the visa starts. You have to register the visa to a long-term address within 90 days. So if you don't arrive in France within the 90 days, you could potentially have a problem. I, I don't, you, you need to, you need to know when you're going to actually be in France before you submit your visa application. Like if you're not sure when you're going to be able to come, there's no point in applying for your visa. So I understand wanting to do it in advance, but 90 days is usually plenty. I will say though, if you're applying for a talent passport visa, you need to leave a lot of time. Our clients, despite our best efforts to provide everything and to provide it way before they asked for it, the consulate is not that efficient at processing them. They don't always know what documents they need. They don't always know that the documents that you provide match up to the things that are on the list. I don't know how many of those they process per year, but my, I suspect that it's not that many. And our most recent clients, it was 90, they applied 83 days before their departure date and it was not enough. They needed the full 90. They were lucky to get it within 90 days of their appointment. And only because we pushed the consulate as aggressively as I felt was appropriate. I don't, I, I don't like to be too 
assertive with the consulate or with the prefecture because they do hold your fate in their hands. I mean, we we did follow up with them quite regularly. Okay, Michael's question in the Q and A panel is that 183 days conti contiguous or accumulated? Meaning, can I spend three months in France, leave, spend another three months later in the year without having to have a visa? So, the 183 days is one of the criteria that helps to determine whether or not you are a tax resident of France if there's a question about what country your tax residency is. What you are talking about is the visa waiver program in which you can spend up to 90 days in France within a 180 day period and not need a visa. Like you can come to France for three months and then leave for three months and then come back for three months pretty much inevitably. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. You could go to a country that is not in Schengen. You can go to the UK. The UK allows Americans to hang out for up to six months without, without a visa. I mean, you, the 183 days is sort of the tiebreaker in a, count, in a year, a 300, 183 out of 365 to de determine where your tax residency is. All right. Brett and Karen, as the date to schedule our December VFS appointment draws near, any update on the status of your favorite website and the ability to make U.S. appointments? I just made one, and the U.S. is still not in the list of countries, but I'm happy to report that our clients who had to say they were Canadian did not have, an, did not have problems at their appointment. Well, they had problems at their appointment, but they were unrelated to this particular issue. So for those of you who are not aware, I filmed a video a couple of weeks ago where I was making a visa appointment for a client on the VFS website and the VFS website, you have to choose the nationality of your passport in order to put in your passport details and make the appointment. And so if you click on the drop down menu with all of the countries that your passport could potentially be from, the United States is not listed. It's not listed under Etats-Unis, it's not listed with the E's, it's not listed with the E's that have accents, like at the very bottom, this is in, in, in French. And it's a complete mystery as to why I tagged VFS in an Instagram reel, they responded and told me to contact their customer service, I did, I have not received any updates on that. Separately, I contacted VFS for the same client for a different issue, where Theoretically, you're supposed to be able to reschedule VFS appointments within less than within more than 48 hours of your appointment. And the system is not was not letting me do that. I was about 54 hours in advance of my client's appointment. She had to reschedule because her husband's like was supposed to get his visa and then fly back to France and then she was going to go back and get her visa and it's a whole thing. His hasn't been issued yet, so she's waiting. So she had to push her appointment back. And the it wasn't working. The guy, I, I contacted their customer service, which I think is in India. And the guy was basically like, well, if it's not working, it means you can't do it. And I was like, but that's not your policy. So I don't know if like they changed their policy and it's not listed anywhere or what the deal is. But I had a pretty vigorous back and forth with this guy, like, but your policy is more than 48 hours and it's more than 48 hours. And he was like, but if the website doesn't let you do it, then the website does, is correct. I was like, no, that's not how anything works. So I'm going to do an Instagram reel on the crazy things VFS has said to my clients, but yeah, I don't know what to make of that. I just realized that I didn't, I posted the link for signing up for Bloom and it was only sent to me, which is kind of dumb. All right. Next question. I understand, Michelle, I understand what visa I need to ensure I can renew and stay permanently in France, but the visa website is confusing. Can we go through the site together and ensure that I choose the right option at each step? Yes, you can schedule a paid consultation with me and we can go through that together. It is also when with our clients, we do the complete visa forms, we have them ready and we make the appointments. Like we have our client on the call, we do everything to make the appointment and then the client pays for the, the fee. So usually like they read us their card number and we put it, we do screen share and put it in and 
then they get the text to confirm that they want to make the payment and all of that. But let me give you the link to make a paid consultation appointment. So a paid consultation is an hour of my time where you can ask whatever questions you want about moving to France, about your personal situation, about your visa application. We can go and make your appointment or go through the visa forms. I do not read business plans or evaluate those during that time. That's a separate service that I do provide because I like to read the business plans, take notes on them in advance, and then review them and answer questions during a call. But I will do a call where you're just answering your questions or going through the visa forms or, or something like that, that I can just have it in front of me while we're, while we're talking. I want to be able to work in France at some point, but I have the means to live there initially for five years without earning income. May I go on the, on the non-working visa and plan to work after five years when I apply for my 10-year residence card? You're not going to get a 10-year residence card if you're on a visitor status for five years. You can apply to change your status at some point, but that's going to involve putting together a business plan or getting a salaried work contract or something that would justify changing the status. If the prefecture does, for some reason, give you a multi-year card or a 10-year card at the end of five years, it is more than likely going to be one that has a visitor status on it still that would not entitle you to work. So it's not a good plan to wait out the five years and hope for the right to work at the end. I could also plan to work during the first five years and apply for the Profession Liberal visa instead, better plan but I would rather avoid the business plan approval process and the pressure of having to earn the required income during my first five years. I have other priorities during that time. I don't know what to tell you. It's easier to get it approved through the consulate and in English. And we know what the procedure is right now for getting it approved. We don't know what the status of this, of that visa will be in five years. We don't even know we don't even know what it'll be next year. One of the things in foolproof French visas that I mentioned is like a lot of these business plans now are subject to approval in advance through the DREET system. Uh, Profession Liberal is currently not subject to pre-approval. It is just approval through the consulate and it's usually pretty straightforward. Same thing for Profession Artistique. Those are not requiring pre-approval at this time. But certain other business plans are, like there's now a pre-approval process for the Passport to Law Entrepreneur that is going through the Ministry of the Economy, and that adds a good four to six weeks to the process. That was something that changed while we had three Passport Talent visa applications sitting in the consulate, and they changed the process like in the middle of our applications and suddenly came back to us for them, even though... It was not a thing that existed when we submitted the application. So I, I wouldn't recommend you're, you're going to have to, you're going to have to change your status at some point if you want to switch from a visitor visa to being able to work in some capacity. So it's up to you when you would like to do it, but it will be whatever, whatever regulations are in effect during that time that will apply to you. And if you're submitting it in France for approval, it's going to have to be in French. Whereas if you're submitting it through the consulate in the U.S., it can be in English. Michelle, different Michelle. Michelle S. How long after arriving does it typically take to get to the point where one can start working with clients? Seems like it would be easier to rent a semi-permanent place after one has started working. So we advise what we advise our clients to do. And we have like an email sequence that everybody gets. Well, that I'm finishing up that everybody's going to get sort of like telling you what to do and when. We advise our clients to get housing for one month initially, maybe six weeks, and to really spend those first couple of weeks finding a long-term address. Some people are working with some, some real estate agencies or rental agencies that work with Americans or work with expats. Some people do that before they come. Other people will do it when they first get here and just really hit the ground running. I think it's a lot easier to get people to call you back to once you're able to meet them in person and once you're actually on site. And then what we do is as soon as our clients tell us we signed a lease and have an address and they tell us what their address is at that point, we do the OV validation and the auto entrepreneur registration like the same week. So, or the week they move in. So if somebody signed a lease now for moving in like October 20th, we would do, we would wait 
until like the 15th and do and do those forms on like the week of the 15th so that whatever comes to them in the mail wouldn't come before they moved in on the on the 20th. Can you say something about defining one's primary versus ancillary activities and how to avoid throwing spaghetti at the wall? E.g. a prof professor teaching tutoring English as their primary and their primary academic discipline, offering test prep, editing, research, and writing. So I would say you want to focus as much as possible in the business plan on like two, maybe three very related things. Like let's say you wanted to do test prep and essay writing for kids applying to university in English speaking countries or teaching English and TOEFL prep or something. I would keep it fairly narrowly focused, but all of those, like when you actually go to register the activities, those are going to be basically two main activities. You're going to have tutoring and you're going to have like writing and editing. It doesn't necessarily matter. Like you can just academic tutoring is an activity or indépendant uh, de langue is an activity like independent language teaching. So all of those would fall under the same thing, but really you want to focus the business plan on a very narrow set of activities and the clients that will need them. All right. So that kind of takes care. I'm going to look up at the, at our question submission form, because those are all the ones that I have in my list right now. Teresa, what marriage or divorce documents do you need for the visa application? Do you need documents for all marriage or divorces? No. So the only thing that you will need for the visa application in terms of marriage and divorce certificates are if you are applying with a partner, then you, and or a spouse, I guess, then you would need a marriage certificate, especially if you're sharing financial resources. You don't, you won't need any divorce certificates. If you are applying and you have children, then you need to provide either the birth certificate that shows that your spouse is the other legal parent of the children, or you need to provide like documents related to custody and like showing that you have permission to move the minor child to a new country. So that's kind of what you'll need for marriage and divorce certificates. Now, when you arrive in France, you could be required to show marriage and divorce certificates to track your name changes. So let me give you an example. I have one client who has been married several times. And in between her marriages, she did not go back to her maiden name. So she has to show each set of papers to like track her names between what is on her birth certificate and what her current married name is. She had to do this specifically for Amélie, like the health insurance people, because the, the health insurance people will put your birth name on your birth certificate on your on your health insurance card so if you are providing like your passport and all kinds of other documents that are listed in your married name they're going to want to see your birth certificate and how you got to whatever legal documents bring you to your current married name the only other thing that I can think of off the top of my head is if you are getting married or paxed in France, you will need to provide all of those documents for previous marriages and divorces. And if you eventually want to be naturalized as a French citizen, you will also need to provide the history of other marriages and divorces that you've had. But in most cases, like if you got married, let, let, let's say you have your birth name, you get married, you change your name, you get divorced, you change back to your birth name, you get married again, like you're not going to have to provide the documents for that first marriage in most cases, because what they're really interested in is like, you had your birth name, you had your birth name when you did the second marriage. So it's easy to track. Whereas like, if you have your birth name, you get married once, you keep the married, you keep the first married name, 
you get when you get divorced and then you change from the first married name to the second married name directly without going back, then it's more complicated. You're going to have to provide more paperwork. Hopefully that's clear. Second question, what does Fast Track to France cover? So Fast Track to France is a program to help you get ready to move to France. And it covers the nine areas of France formation, which are, let me see if I can remember all of them off the top of my head, finances, career, visas, housing, local community, children, healthcare, and international travel and mobility. So to give you an example, so there's there's workbooks and worksheets and videos in each section. Let me let me pull up the sales page. I can show it to you. I will show you what the what the areas are. Okay, cultural adaptation. I missed that one. And each of these modules has some videos and some very important aspects of things that are going to make or break your move to France. So for example, in career and business, there's a lot of how are you going, if, especially if you're not going to be retired, how are you going to develop your career in France? Are you going to have to pivot? Are you in a field where you're going to be able to find a job and get sponsored for a work visa? Spoiler alert, probably not. Are you going to start a business in which case, like, how can you turn your current, whatever your current activity is into a business idea that then you can develop in complete French business incubator in the finances module where we talk, we have modules on the tax treaty on how French taxes work on estate planning and international financial planning. We have recommendations for all of these professionals. We're not certified accountants or notaires or anything like that. What we can, what we can do, like we can tell you the questions to ask or the places where you might have, where your situation might be a little bit more complicated than you think it is. We actually just had somebody who <laughs> her situation is one that we deal with regularly where somebody who is self-employed in the U S who wants to move to France and needs to bring, bring their activity with them and sort of navigating how, how that process works. And it's a little bit more complicated than you might want to believe. Visas and immigration goes a little bit more in depth into the consequences of all of the different choices of visas that are possible. We do have some videos about how to fill out the visa forms in there, how to make the VFS appointment, things like that. So that's a good resource as well if you don't need our personalized help with that. Finding housing, we have videos on rental agreements, on finding properties to rent, on things like your renters, on purchasing property, on insurance, health and wellness. We have videos about the French healthcare system, about things you need to do to get ready health wise before you move, how your different health, how your health situation might be covered in France. Friends and family is just a lot of tips on navigating, like moving abroad, being in a different time zone ways that you can sort of stay in touch with with technology like our app suggestions and and things like that and how to make friends in France as well local life is how to find activities to join how to get your kids enrolled in school which is required for children who are going to be moving with you you need to do pre-enrollment in school before you apply for their visa cultural adaptation has a lot of like tips and tricks for what you want to what you want to know with for dealing with French administration and how to do it without getting too frustrated. And international relocation has a lot of things on like moving and shipping your belongings and the forms that you need to do and things like international driver's licenses and the logistics of getting you and your stuff actually here. So that is available on our website. I will put it in here. Some of the options do have calls with us as well, or calls with me, and it is something that we give to all of our clients. So if you're working with us on one of our relocation packages, you do get access to Fast Track to France and all of the modules as well. All right, Tom, I am seeing more evidence that it's possible to work remotely with a visitor visa and wanted to get your latest opinion about this. No, it is not. There might be people doing it. I would not want to be those people when the tax office comes knocking at their doors. It is not possible to work when you are on a visitor visa. Don't do it. What are some, Kimberly, what are some hidden admin fees once you get to France? Okay, so not a ton. Okay, so when you 
are doing the visa application process, the fees are, there's 99 euros per person for the visa processing fee. There's about 30 euros, it's $33 as of an hour ago, $33 for making the visa appointment, that's per person at VFS. There is, you do have to get the passport photos that are the correct type for the French visa. I normally just recommend doing them at VFS because it's easier, but they charge about $13. There's also the fee to have your passport shipped back to you. The consulate used to take one FedEx envelope for the entire family, and now VFS sells you one FedEx envelope per person, and sometimes they get delivered on different days. So that's about $35 for an overnight FedEx envelope. So those are the charges related to the visa application. If you're on a visitor visa, you do have to get that temporary insurance as well. That's currently the only visa application type for which it is required. Now, once you get to France, if you are on a visa that is validated into a carte de séjour directly, so any of your passport to Lant visa types, you're going to pay a, a 225 euro fiscal, and that is going to get you your carte de séjour, which they've been giving them for four years, which is good. If you are on any of the other visa types, so visitor, profession libérale, vie privée, familiale, any of those that are validated online, it's going to be a 200 euro fee for an adult for validating the visa and doing the OP visit and all of that, one-time fee. For children, there is the DCM, the Document de Circulation uh, pour étranger mineur. This is also covered in Fast Track to France, what that is and how to do it and, and what, the, what the procedure is because children do not validate their visas in the same way that adults do. The DCM is 50 euros for, per child and that is processed online. All of these things are paid with something called a temple fiscal. So basically you, you pay money online on the government tax website. You get a 16 or 20 digit code that you then put into whatever website you're paying for. If you are exchanging your driver's license, the fee for the, your most of your cost in that is going to be the certified translation fees for the front and back of, excuse me, the front and back of your driver's license and your driving, excuse me, your driving record. What else? There aren't a lot, there, French administration is not particularly fee heavy. Like there's no fee to enroll your children in school. There's no fee to even exchanging your driver's license. I don't think there's a fee attached to that. If you have to get your driver's license from scratch, it is quite pricey, but exchanging it, I don't think they've been asking our clients to pay a fee. Submitting your business plan to the Ministry of the Economy, no fee for that. I'm struggling to think of things that would be that would have a fee attached to them. The thing about the thing about French bureaucracy, like one of the reasons that it works slow, like there is no way to speed it up by paying extra. It is considered a public service. So it's not it's not heavily fee based. So those are really the only things that I can think of off the top of my head. I would not I would not expect any fees beyond that. And Kimberly, you need to set up a call with me. Amber, is it best to do a long-term visa if you're not sure how long you'll be in France? Yes, it is best to ensure that you have a visa that is for more than one year and renewable. And it's one of the many visa types in foolproof French visas. Linda, I want to travel when I come to France. I want to live in Nice as my primary residence. Do I need an apartment for three straight months or can I give them a list of all the places with apartments or hotels that I will be traveling to? During the year, can I go out to the country, to Italy to, or Denmark? I also have two tours with Rhodes Scholar planned during the first three months I will be in France. I do not want to have to pay twice for a place to stay. So can I just list all the places that I'm going to stay market, marked paid? No. So if you're a resident of France, you need a long term, you need a visa that lists a long term address. You need to change your address every time you move with the prefecture, and you do not want to be doing that every two weeks. So if you do not have a regular and stable residence in France, then what you are very likely to not have, or it's possible that you would not have your visa renewed. So you need to 
work out a place to live, even if it's a studio for 500 euros a month, 400, there, there are places that are less expensive. I don't know what the market is in Nice, but I think it's fairly pricey, but there are places where you can have rent studio rentals that aren't that expensive. And I would recommend finding a less expensive place that you can maintain as a residence and where you can get mail because you also like, if you're signing up for health insurance and stuff like that, you're going to need to, you're going to need to have, get your mail or have somebody check your mail. We have some clients, like one of they're married, one of them got their OP convocation by email. The other one had it mailed to him and they weren't, they weren't here. They weren't in France. So like we had to tell them, well, you need to get somebody to check your mail. And luckily they had a neighbor who was able to do that. Question two, do birth, marriage, and divorce certificates need to be translated or anything else? Or can they be official documents in English from the U.S.? What needs to be translated or apostilled? Anything. So birth certificates, normally what we tell people is for birth certificates, you can send one in English to CEPAM when you sign up for health insurance. We have occasionally, like some departments have come back and wanted a birth certificate with an equity and a translation for the health insurance. That is the exception rather than the rule. I would say that we've had one out of, you know, I'd say a hundred clients where they wanted, they wanted a translation and that was deep, but mostly not. I already went over the question about the marriage and divorce certificates earlier. For the visa application, you don't need anything translated. For your renewal, if you are renewing with, and they ask for a birth certificate, then it needs to have a certified translation. If they want a marriage certificate, which they mostly want, yeah, if you're both visitors and you're sharing financial resources, then they'll want a certified translation. If you are the spouse of a talent passport holder, they will also want the marriage certificate with a translation. But usually we tell people that they don't have to get anything translated until it's time for renewal, if that's the if that's the situation. We have a full list of documents in our client orientation and in Fast Track to France that all of the documents that you should bring with you, everything that you should get translated and at what point, and our list of certified translators. And we're working on building, we're working on building a resource guide. I had sort of started this last year at around this time that has recommendations for things like certified translators and accountants and notaires and people that are that our clients have used and that people have recommended to us as professionals that that you can use as well. So we're we're putting together a little directory. Let me see if I can pull it up and show you. I think I can screen share for a second. So this is very much a work in progress, but we're putting together a resource guide here in Notion and it's going to have a lot of different associations, a lot of recommendations. We're going to allow people from the Americans and France community to add their own businesses and, and such in here as well. And even recommendations for like healthcare professionals and things like that to who speak English and, and that are good. So that's something to look out for in the coming weeks and months. All right, let me pull some of the questions from the Q&A box. Eric, do you have any general advice regarding spousal visas? Do you mean the spouse of a French citizen or the spouse of an EU citizen or the spouse of somebody else? Spouse of a French citizen, you need to make sure that the marriage is registered with the French consulate where you got married before applying for the visa. It's going to take six to eight weeks to get the livret de famille and the transcription of the marriage certificate in the service d'état civil in Nantes before you can before the spouse can apply for his or her visa. So there's that. Spouse of an EU citizen applies for a cut to séjour directly in France for 225 euros. A spouse of anybody else, I don't know. How does the French government track the 183 days? Is it based on the time you are renting? No, it's based on entry into Schengen and stamps in your passport. If you're getting to the point where somebody is trying to like go through your passport to prove where your tax resident, you're paying your accountants a lot of money. So resolve it before it gets to that point. As a French citizen moving back to France, am I eligible for the French health insurance? Yes. And you do not have to wait. 
as of right now, you don't have to wait. They may reinstate the 90 day waiting period at some point, but they lifted it during COVID. And there is a form called the demande d'ouverture des droits à la science maladie. I don't have one handy. I'm bringing a bunch of them to Bloom next week. I will give you one if you're at Bloom. But it's very easy to find. It's very easy to find online. There are documents to attach, like your birth certificate and copy of your passport and bank information and things like that. But it's a fairly straightforward form. I will type in the chat. If you Google that, demande d'ouverture des droits à la science maladie, you will find it very easily. This is something that we do for all of our clients, no matter what their visa type is. Okay, I'm unofficially separated from my husband and he's not coming. Is this an issue? No, we have a not insignificant, a non-zero number of clients who are in that situation where they're in the process of divorce and are leaving, leaving the country. I'm wanting eventual naturalization. What about having some of my assets in a joint account with my daughter? Is that a problem? No, nobody's going to be looking at who you have joint accounts with. The only issue I potentially foresee with naturalization is you would want to be divorced by that point. When you are married, they sort of expect that you're going and you're applying for naturalization and you're married to somebody who is also not French. They kind of expect that you're going to be applying for naturalization with with your spouse. So if you're not, they want an explanation for that, which we could certainly provide five years down the line, but it would complicate things in terms of inheritance. If you were to die as a tax resident of France, subject to French inheritance laws and still still technically married to somebody on paper, you would want to talk to a notaire about how that would play out. Rebecca, just to clarify something you said earlier, without a visa, are we able to go back to France for three months, come home for three, and then go back for another three months all in the same year? Yeah, it's it's 90 days out of 183 days. So if you Google something called a Schengen calculator, you can put in your travel dates and see if you're legal, basically. But basically, what you do is you look at like On October 3rd, 2022, if I look back six months, if I look back 183 days, so that would take you to around April 3rd, 2022, have I spent more than 90 days in the Schengen space between April 3rd and October 3rd, 2022? And then two weeks into the future, look back, okay, from... From April 17th to October 17th, 2022, have I spent more than 90 days in Schengen? And as long as, as long as you haven't spent more than 90 days in the past 183 days, then you're good in terms of Schengen rules. So there are calculators where you can go, just Google them. You can put in your travel dates and it will keep track for you. And it will tell you like when you can go back to Schengen. Now, as of right now, the tracking process isn't that robust. But I expect that there's going to be this ETS system, the European Travel Authorization System, that is supposed to come into effect. It was already supposed to come into effect at the end of this year. They've now pushed it back till the end of next year. But in that case, I think they really are going to start like tracking people's passports and tracking the number of days that people have spent in the country. So when they scan your passport at border control in any Schengen country, they will be able to tell how many days you have spent in Schengen and whether or not you've gone over. Now, right now, they're kind of relying on flipping through your passport and seeing if seeing when the last entry stamp is, but they're not super on point with it. But I expect that going forward, when they do have when when they do have that system in place, they're going to be paying a lot more attention. Eric, does it make a difference in terms of spousal visas if my wife keeps her last name or changes it to mine when we get married? It does not make a difference. France considers that your name at birth is your name forever and your spousal name, if you choose to use your spouse's name, and this goes in both directions, if you choose to use your spouse's name, it is a nom d'usage, but it does not really become your legal name in the same way that your name, your name at birth stays your name. So most official forms, you have If it says no, if it says name, like that is your name at birth. And then it will, then there will be a second line, non d'usage, and you fill it out. So like when I fill out forms, it's my nom is always grant. 
And my nom d'usage is always Lunes. And if I were to ever get divorced, then I would only have the right to continue using my spouse's name as a nom d'usage if I can justify it for professional reasons and I get permission during the divorce process. But my maiden name, like Grant, will have stayed my name on, like it's on my capital, it's on all of my insurance documents, it's on everything. I keep getting confused about visa types. The VLSTS visa is the primary one that you choose if you want to renew. The VL, okay, that stands for visa long séjour, valent titre de séjour. That applies to about half of the visa types. So there is, I don't have, I don't, I, I don't have the list in front of me, so bear with me. There are a couple different things. There's the visa long séjour temporaire, which is for less than one year, it is not renewable. There's the, there's a visa long séjour which is not a titre de séjour, which requires that you request a titre de séjour when you arrive in France. This is like any of the passport talent types. So profession artistique, passport talent entrepreneur, passport talent salarié, carte bleue européenne, any of the famille accompagnante, so the spouse of a passport talent entrepreneur holder, any anything that would be in the passport talent category, and also the spouse of an EU citizen does not have a visa, but requests a carte de séjour on arrival. A visa long séjour valent titre de séjour is a visa that is issued for one year and then validated with OFI. So this would be like your, your visitor, your profession libérale, your vie privée familiale, your, your regular salarié that is not passeport talent, your travailleur temporaire, if you're a language assistant or in a seasonal position, a student visa, au pair, and any of like your temporary work visas, like work holiday visas, that kind of thing. All of those are, so there's probably about half of the visa types that are VLS, TS visas, visa long séjour, valent titre de séjour. So a visa that becomes a titre de séjour when you validate it with OPI. It's the primary one you want to choose if you want to renew and stay permanently. Then you further choose Profession Libérale if you want to work for a freelancer, but it's still on, no, it's not on the parent visitor visa. It has nothing to do with visitor visa. V VLSTS, like people, people will say erroneously online, they'll call everything a long stay visa. Well, there's 27 types of long stay visas. So that does, that means literally nothing to me. All a long stay visa means is that it's for more than 12 months. Okay, Eric says, I am dual French US, my wife is US. It, it doesn't matter whether she changes her name or not. And I would say for administrative purposes, don't bother changing your name. It's, it makes everything harder. Keep your maiden, keep your maiden name, put your nom d'usage on for cosmetic purposes, if you want to. Martine, since the Schengen visa does not apply to me, a Schengen visa does not apply to Americans broadly because a Schengen visa is a travel, a tourist visa for up to 90 days out of a 365 day period. Are you saying that 183 days are based on my entry stamped on my passport is when the 183 days begin and end when I leave France and go back to the USA? But what about the days I will not be in France, but rather traveling across Europe? Okay, you're making this too complicated. You need to have a primary residence. Where is your butt spending most of the time? Where is your lease? Where is the center of your familial and economic interests? If you're a dual citizen, nobody's, nobody cares about when you enter or exit different countries. But at some point, like both countries are going to want to know where you're paying your taxes. So where is that happening? That's the answer to the question. That's, that's the question that you need to think about. The thing, to th the thing, the thing that you want to think about is not how is the government tracking where I'm spending my 183 days? The thing that you need to consider is if I get audited by the tax office and the tax office wants to tell me I'm a resident and that I owe all these taxes on, I don't know, business income or capital gains or whatever, how are you going to prove that you're not? So that's what you need to, that's what you need to consider. But I mean, if you if you are spending significant time in France and you're covered by the French healthcare system and you're traveling in Europe and you have a European healthcare card, if anything were to happen to you, if you get hit by a bus in Germany or break your ankle in Germany, as unfortunately happened to one of our clients a couple of weeks ago, counting France as your country of residence because they're covering your healthcare costs in that situation. All right. I think I've got 
a couple more questions here that I didn't get to that were pre-submitted. All right, Linda, what are some good interna international health insurance plans for people over 65? So we typically recommend a Mondashore insurance. Now, the caveat that I give for Mondashore is I consider it more of a cost up of the visa application. I'm not sure how easy it would be to actually get reimbursed. The plans are typically between four and 600 euros per year for the minimum that meets the requirements of the visitor visa. So that being said, one of the things we advise people in Fast Track to France, we give people a health checklist to take care of before they leave. Things like getting 90 days of any prescription medications that you're on, making sure you have any checkups for any conditions, getting new glasses, cleaning, getting your teeth cleaned, things like that, that you want to do before you leave the U.S., before you leave your current health plan. And you're applying to be on the French health care plan after 90 days. You're not necessarily going to be on it after 90 days because it takes some time to process. But really, you're looking at coverage for catastrophic events that might happen in the period between when you arrive in France and when you were covered by the French healthcare system. There are plans that are several hundred euros per month that you do have to sign up for one year, and those might be more likely to cover medications or more complicated health issues. Is it worth it for that three to four, three to five month gap? And that's really something that, that you have to assess. When should I make an appointment to visit the consulate? I plan to go to France at the beginning of January. So any time that is convenient for you, you can apply up to 90 days before. So you're right in the window, the beginning of the 90 days. There's no particular rush. It doesn't take excessively long to get your visa at this time of year. There's not, I was, I was making an appointment earlier for client in Los Angeles and there were appointments available on Wednesday. So it's not, there's no rush at this time of year. It's not like in August, it can be very difficult to get appointments at the visa centers because all of the students are applying, but that's not the case at this time of year. All right. I think that was actually all of the questions. Let me just take a look at the chat, see if there's anything else in here that I didn't get. All right. Any last questions for this month's Q&A? Martine says, you're right. I'm making this more difficult than what it is. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Michelle, coming with medical issues, what kind of medical issues? So what we advise, and again, this is all in Fast Track to France, what we advise, so if you have some kind of medication that you're on, if you have some kind of chronic health condition, we want you to come with at least 90 days of medication. We want you to come with a copy of your prescription. We want you to look up and make sure that your most important medications are available in France before you come. And if not, like we need to try to, you need to look into an equivalent and make sure that an equivalent is available and maybe ask people who might have a similar condition or might be on a similar medication who have gone through the same thing to see what options might be available for you if your main medication isn't covered. I'll give the example of Wellbutrin, which is a common antidepressant in the U.S. We have, we've had some clients who have been on that. And in France, it is used typically as a, a drug to help people stop smoking. And so they put some kind of like, I don't know if it's nicotine or like something, there's something else in it in the French version that if you're not a smoker, like it kind of makes you sick. So those are you're either going to have to adapt or take regular trips to Italy where a version of Wellbutrin is available that does not have the anti, like the nicotine stuff in it. So if you're on like stimulant medication for ADHD, for example, that's one thing that can be really difficult to get in France. So you have to look at what the alternatives are and maybe consult with a doctor or figure out how you're going to get that medication when you're here. So we also have had patient or had patients. We've had clients who have had like chronic health conditions, things like lupus, where the person had to get a regular, get regular lab work 
I think the first time he did it, he, it was like every three months. The first time he did it, I think he had to pay out of pocket, which was like 200 euros. Okay. Like you're not breaking the bank for any medical tests in France. Like it's not like thousands of dollars. Like you may pay if you had to pay out of pocket in the U S diabetes, hypertension. So you would have to, what, whatever medication you have, you would want to look and see and make sure that it's available in France first. You would want to make sure that the formula is the same or substantially similar so that you don't get sick by trying something new. Then make sure that you bring your prescriptions and get to a French doctor relatively quickly to get, to get an equivalent French prescription. The thing about chronic health conditions is that once you are on the French system, you will be covered as having a, a, an ALD, an affectation longue durée, which means that 100% of the care related to your conditions is going to be covered 100% without you having to pay a dime out of pocket. So I know that diabetes is on that list. The other ones I'm not sure of. Once it's, once it's covered and attached to your carte vitale, like your doctor will obviously follow whatever ongoing care you're going to need for those conditions and everything will be covered. Um, so it's just really, you want to see how much, how much medication can you bring with you to cover that gap? Can you take a trip back to the U S and like stay on your health insurance in the U S for a little while longer to get, to get your medication topped up before you're fully in the French system finding there are comprehensive health plans that will cover those medications. Like private health plans that will cover you for France and for Europe, but they tend to be really expensive. So if there's a way to avoid that, then I would fully, fully cover it. There's no such thing in France as a pre-existing condition. Like the concept doesn't exist. Michael, how long does it take to get an international driver's license? An international driver's license is basically like a form that you fill out at AAA, or it's a translation into French of your current driver's license. It does not, it does not replace your license and enable you to drive in France longer than one year. When you be, when you have a visa, when you become a resident of France, you need to exchange your driver's license in within one year. And that is only if you come from a state that is eligible to be exchanged for a French driver's license. So Massachusetts, Connecticut, Florida, I'm not going to name all of them because I don't know all of them, but there's about 17, I think. Colorado, Michigan, Illinois, Texas are the, are the main ones that I can think of. California, no. New York, no. Maryland, yes. Virginia, yes. North Carolina, no. South Carolina, I think so. Or the other way around. One of the Carolinas, yes. One of the Carolinas, no. So you need to exchange that process. This is something we do for our clients. You need to exchange the license within the first year. If you do not have a license that can be exchanged, then you can only drive for one year on your U.S. license from a state that is not exchangeable. And then you have to take the French driving test. Now, you don't have to go through the whole, you don't have to necessarily do the 20 hours of driving, but you do need to take the written and the, and the practical test. There are some schools kind of that do it in English, but all right, cool. So thank you for coming, everybody. You have the details in the chat if you would like to schedule a one-hour consultation with me to talk about your questions about moving to France. You can go ahead and do that. Fast Track to France is our program that covers everything that you need to do before you move here. All of our clients get access to it. So if you're going to work with us on a personal on one of our relocation packages, you don't have to purchase that separately. We are available for taking on working with you for your move to France. Right now, you're looking at the beginning of 2023. So if you want to start 2023 with a new life in France, then let's talk about how to make that happen. I will give you a link also to schedule a call with us. So this will be somebody from our team who will call you to talk about your plans for moving to France to see if you have any questions about any of our packages. And then if it's a good fit, if you're ready to get started, then you can hop on a quick call with me. We'll select your package. We'll do a quick orientation. 
And then of course, you'll get access to our client orientation, Fast Track to France, complete French business incubator if you are going to be self-employed. And then you can also start scheduling your calls to get your visa application done, your business plan done, and to work on that move to France. So I will see you next time. Next Q&A call is, let me look at the calendar. Let me tell you, Monday, November 7th. So in five weeks from today, I believe. Monday, November 7th at 7 p.m. France time. And you can sign up via the same link. You can submit your questions also via the same link. And we hope to see you then. So thank you so much for coming and have a great rest of your day. Take care.